by the way, can I say, Lynn, may I ask, how long do you want me to talk for? We didn't mention this. Uh, about 45 minutes. Great. And, but I want the opportunity for people to ask questions. It's very yeah. important that people yeah. ask what they want to. Okay. Now I know. Very good. Thank you. Anyway, Ahmed says to me, uh, get over very quickly. Come to, uh, and, um, the, and he told me the, the, on the phone uh, that the head of the, uh, whatever the Jewish section had just come and whatever like this. And we go to, uh, he and I and a group of American soldiers who were with the, uh, the marvelous former New York Times journalist, Judith Miller, he and she was embedded in this team of, uh, of weapons of mass destruction people, uh, people looking for weapons of mass destruction. And believe me, they were there, even if the news says otherwise. And we went along with Chalobi's people to the Mukhabarat headquarters. And you can see right here, uh, this is what was, what remains of it. Now, the reason it looks this way is when the Americans when we uh, uh, were uh, when we bombed Baghdad, we dropped a bomb, uh, which was supposed to be uh, it's a, like a two thousand pound one ton bomb, on this building, expecting that it would dis would level it would destroy it, but it didn't work that way. This is miracle number one, and this this besides the fact that Tel Aviv the guy, the Jew, head of the Jewish section came to Tel Aviv. This is one of the reasons we have this archive today. Now, what happens is the bomb hits. Can you guys see I'm using my arrow? Um, Do you see an arrow moving at the top of the building? A white, my white computer arrow? If the no, answer is I, no, I, just, no, I don't no. have a pointer, so it's a little hard for me to do anything here. <laughs> anyway, um, the bomb goes, is dropped on this building. You can see even go, it's about a five story building. And it goes through the building. It actually comes out right one floor. Let me, here we go. Um, uh, you see this? It comes out a hole in the building, lodges in the ground and doesn't explode. Unbeknownst to me, and I, I might have worked at the Pentagon for 28 years, but I know nothing about arms and military technology. It comes through the building, comes out the hole that you see here in the center, lodges in the ground. Miracle of miracles, the two windows that you see, when we went over to, to see where the, where the Jewish section was, miracle of miracles, it, it's right where those where the bomb came out. It should have destroyed the whole building. Instead, what it did, it went through the building and it destroyed the water system. You can see uh, uh, this was an, the other side of the building, but you can see the water dripped, dripped, dripped down. And it got up to waist size. Uh, uh, you see the lines on the walls here in this corridor? Um, the water was up to uh, the, 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 it looks like there's a straight line and then there's like white things above it. I'm sorry, I, I don't have a pointer, I can't show you. Um, but the line there is where the water went up to. Now I'm a short guy. I'm about five foot six. And had I gone into this my, myself, I would have been way above my, we would say my navel. Here on this picture, what you see is they're measuring. Here is the guy, we're go they're going downstairs into the basement where the Jewish archives were and the Israel archives were. And, um, Bang, he's measuring. It's a little hard to see, but um, there are probably about six steps more down from what you see. So you can see that the water had filled the basement and it kept dripping down because the, you know, there was no attempt to destroy. It was just that the water 
the bomb destroyed the water system, which leaked and leaked and leaked. And so the question was, what do we do? So Chelobi asks me, what do you want to do? Now, I'm an Orthodox Jew. Um, I didn't know I was a Jew until I was five years old. It was not important in my family growing up, at least as far as I understand. And once when you come back to, to your Jewish identity, you, you can't miss an opportunity like this. You, you know, and when he asked, when Chelebi, who was a Shiite Muslim, asked, what do I want to do? It took me a billionth of a second. We have to somehow save them. In Judaism, saving materials, saving Torahs, we didn't really know at first what was there. But seeing there, we were told by this, this guy, the, the, the guy who worked for Saddam, that there was an ancient copy of the Talmud on parchment from the seventh century. Well, it shows how much he understood it. That was not, wasn't true, but, um, uh, but you know, anyway, we knew there was stuff there. So how are we gonna save it? The Americans in the beginning, uh, I, we just found out, I didn't know that they were actively not interested in such things at first. They again become the saviors at the end, just know it. Um, and Chelobi said, well, what do you wanna do? I said, well, I'd like to do anything I can to save it. And so what happens? He, out of his own pocket, gets, you see this like, red truck here? There was barely electricity for a few hours a day in Iraq. There was no running water. There was no anything. And how were we going to get the water out so we could wade in there? Now, who would then be we? Chalabi hired a whole slew of Shiite workers to go in and help get the stuff out. And what you see here is a truck, which was a uh, it, it sucked out the water and it went from like above, let's say, my, my navel to around my knees. Now, let's go inside. And by the way, this was here alive. The whole time, I actually, actually, stupid me actually went and even petted the thing. Now, why I say stupid me, um, the thing could have exploded any time. It did not explode. Um, you know, Hashem had other plans. Here, what happens is you went down those stairs that I had shown before. There we go. You turn right. The first room on the right, the first thing which you see on the right side there, was where the Israel section of the, uh, uh, of the Iraqi archives was. Uh, excuse me, the, the Iraqi uh, uh, intelligence services. Now it's logical that since Iraq was an enemy of Israel, that they would have an Israel, Israel section. And uh, uh, this was a Monday. You'll see why that becomes important in a moment. And on Wednesday, this is the hallway down. Ah, I'm, I'm pointing. I'm sorry. You can't see. You see this a guy in a soldier's uniform. Actually, to tell you the truth, he was an Iraqi Jordanian who was helping helping me. And they're going down the hall, and the room is on where the Jewish material was held is on the left at the end of this hall. Now, here is what it looked like inside. Now, since it was all waterlogged, and, uh, uh, you know, if you ever have picked up a soaked a book, one book, which is uh, soaked and waterlogged, filled with water, you know how heavy it was. This is what we saw here. It's terrible. Um, and what we, we made a chain. Uh, for those of you who know me, you may recognize somebody in that picture. Um, uh, and we, are, we made a chain and we were taking it out piece by piece by piece. And uh, here you can see, again, look at the condition that it was in. Before the war, it was not in this condition. One of the questions that may come to mind is why Saddam even had this? Why did he take this? And if the world, he could take anything he wanted. And the world, but why take the Jewish archives? But we'll get to that. Here you see 
um, uh, where people are to chain the guy in sort of the center in the back with a like sort of a striped shirt, not in the back. He gets stuff, he hands it to the guy with the yellow, who hands it to the guy with the gray and white shirt and then comes out. Chalabi had a bunch of uh, areas, a bunch of places that he controlled. One of them was this art gallery. It was called Ulfalu. I understand there are some Baghdadis, uh, Baghdadi Jews that are on the, the, the Zoom here. And um, this is right next to what was called the Hunting Club, which was Chalobi's headquarters. And he had this building as well. So Chalobi gave me this, like a, it's not a field, but this courtyard to dry out the books. I didn't know what to do. I have a PhD in history, but I am not a conservationist. I don't understand archives. And I was very fortunate because every day um, I had phone calls from Jerusalem during almost the entire time that I was there. Um, a, a, a Hasidic Rebbe would even call me uh, Moshe Shabbat to do Havdalah with me. He was in Jerusalem. I was in, in Baghdad. Um, and um, Anyway, uh, here is this, I, I called and my friends in Jerusalem got to the restoration department at the National Library in Jerusalem. And the woman is giving me instructions on how to save the material. First, you gotta take it out. You gotta put it in a cold area. You gotta, I said, ma'am, we have a problem. We don't have a cold area. At this time of year, it can be a hundred and, you know, 115, 15, 20 degrees, let's say between 45 and 50 degrees centigrade or Celsius in, uh, in the shade, uh, there's no such thing. And she is uh, uh, on, and she's giving me instructions. Finally, I said, I'm sorry. Um, uh, we just, there's nothing we can do. And so finally she said, look, do the best you can. And this is what we did. We knew, for example, that anything which was on parchment, leather, that if you dry it out, it becomes like a straitjacket. And you therefore could not dry it out completely. So what we did we, is we put um, uh, the, the books at first that we found out in the sun for about two hours or so. And then uh, when they were sufficiently, they're still wet, they were damp. You see, Chalabi procured for us the, these metal um, uh, trunks you can see here, which is where we put the, uh, uh, the material. Again, the American government is still not involved here. There was a marvelous archivist who was part of the American team, military archivist, but she was told she was not supposed to help me. Uh, she becomes one of the heroes of this in the end too. Um, now, again, in just the oddities thing, I was working on this for six weeks. If you can see around this field, or this, excuse me, this uh, courtyard here, there are these wooden boxes on, there on both sides. They are beehives. I am allergic to bees. We, we were running all over, putting stuff all over the place here. In the six weeks that I was involved in this part of the adventure, I wasn't stung once. But I had no choice but to do this. I had to. This is our heritage. This is who I'm not, in, I'm a Litvak, I'm a Lithuanian Jew. But I had spent years and years on the Jews of the, of the Muslim world. And how could we say, how could I just say, oh, no, the hell with it. It doesn't matter. I, it, I couldn't do this. Just one last thing. The guy who is standing here talking on a satellite phone is uh, the late Max Singer, who died a few months ago. And he, at this time, is talking to his wife in Jerusalem. Max came as a good friend also of Chalobis, Mohammed Chalobis. He came via Turkey, and he, he came down to help in whatever way he could. A wonderful human being. I know if Edwin Schuker is on here, at least, um, Edwin uh, knew uh, Max quite well. Okay, you've now seen the boxes. Now what, 
let's have find some examples of what materials we found. Here is one of the first things we found. It floated down the down towards the front there. What is this? This is a teak. A teak, again, I can't hear anybody, so I, you know, you'll scream. A teak is what Edota um, Mizrach, uh, uh, the Oriental jewelry, Mizrahi jewelry, jewelry, that's what they keep their Torahs in. And, um, and then they're put into the ark. And if you look amazingly, uh, uh, we will see what you see the gold and hand embroidered uh, uh, thing on the right side of the teak here. This is, uh, you know, when we take out the Torah from the ark, this is the Torah that Moshe uh, put before the children of Israel. This uh, teak, this uh, Torah holder. And Sefato that, um, I, and then you, what we eventually found, what the other side was, it Torah was written in 1965. That's long after most of the Jews left. But it's amazing there was still a rabbi who could do this. Now, let's go on. Here's part of a Torah. You see, it's on the ground. Uh, I knew that if we did not, um, uh, dry it off a bit, but it still had to remain damp, then uh, it would just become, again, as I said before, like a straight jacket. You can, that's what happens to the leather the parchment. And I, I remember asking uh, one of my friends in Jerusalem, who's a rabbi during this time, I said, look, if I save this, I have to put the Torah on the ground because there's no long tables. There's nothing we can do. You're not allowed to drop the Torah, put it on the ground. And one of my rabbi friends uh, is yelling at me, this is uh, nefesh. This is saving a soul. How dare you even question this? Of course you're going to put it on the, on the, on the ground. And uh, I, I can't tell you how, you know, the amount of people that were helping and were just doing wonderful, wonderful um, uh, things there. Now, the... Before again, the Americans uh, got involved in this, there was a, a, a problem. What do we do with it once we, we save it all? It can't stay this way. It is clearly in a state of disrepair. So what do we do? And um, I remember that some of the Iraqi opposition leaders who knew about this said, Harold, get this out of the country as soon as possible. Because if it becomes publicly known, we will have no choice but to say it's Iraqi property and, uh, and oppose it's going out. And we're the ones telling you to get it out. See, that way we can, they can blame me, they can blame others, whatever, and not be held responsible. And for those of you who either grew up in Iraq or have some knowledge of Iraqi culture, I am being shamed. It's the worst thing that can happen to you. It's worse than death. Uh, and so they, they're the ones telling me to get it out. Okay. It was like a hot potato. Now, now comes how, how, do, how does this thing get solved? I was extremely fortunate that I had a bunch of friends around the world who, who would call me and ask, you know, wanted to see how I was. And like, I got these weekly phone calls. And one of them was from Natan Sharansky. I would hope everybody knows who he is, former in the Soviet Gulag, then in Israel, a, a minister, then was head of the Jewish agency, and a first-class mensch. Now, Sharansky was a friend of mine, and he was a friend also of Ahmed Chalabi's. Um, So he would call to see how that I'm alive. He, he was saying to me some of the things that I was going through, and believe me, the, the, bureauc the bureaucrats were not particularly happy that there was a, uh, a, a character like me around who, uh, uh, who was reporting directly back to the senior levels of the Pentagon and the White House. The reason is bureaucrats like to control information and they don't like the people on top to be getting things directly. Anyway, Sharansky says, Harold, and I told him we had just discovered this, the Iraqi the Jewish archives, I said, it's unbelievable. 
uh, you will see shortly some of the things that we found. Some go back to the 1500s, and it all tells about who and what the Baghdadi jewelry was. It's it's awesome. Anyway, he said, "Hey, Harold." He says, "Harold, what can I do?" I said, "Listen." I said, "Nothing. You're friends with with uh, Vice President Cheney, also a wonderful man." that the news loves to hate in the United States, but a very decent and kind man. I said, please do me a favor, call Cheney, tell him about this, uh, which he did obviously right away. And then another friend named Richard Pearl, who's a former boss and an older brother to me, uh, who was my boss at the Pentagon many years ago, many years before this time period, he called also all the time to see that I'm alive and okay. I said, Richard, call Rumsfeld, call Secretary Rumsfeld and tell them about. It. Well, if anybody knows how the American government works, and I assume that most other governments on this bureaucratic matter are similar, there was something called a civets. Uh, it's a, a, a every day there was a, uh, a video meeting between, oh, it's like Zoom back in 2003. The, the American president, vice president, secretary of state, head of the CIA, um, uh, the uh, secretary of defense, um, and the, Amer the, the American military leaders in Baghdad uh, who were running the American operation there and then the head of the civilian operation. They had this conference. And remember, they, it, uh, beforehand, no one was interested in helping. When Vice President Cheney, and Secretary Rumsfeld brought up the, they had heard that this, there was a, that they, we had found the Jewish archives and all that. What are we doing to help save it? From that time on, the Americans took it over. And I can only tell you, when American, the American government puts its mind to do something, it can pretty much do anything. It's awesome. Uh, uh, if you remember um, Winston Churchill in World War II, um, I talked about the Americans that, uh, you know, they had, the, 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 the English had had a lot of experience with the Nazis by then. The Americans weren't interested in, in, in listening. They had to find it out themselves. But once they tried every other bad option, they got it right and everything worked like a charm. And that's the way things were here. It was awesome. Now we're going to go and look at a few things, and then I'm going to tell you how we got it out of Iraq. And uh, um, uh, I'm still, I think I have about 15 minutes left. Is that right, Lynn? That's so, right. Yeah, Harold, yeah. if you okay. need a few minutes longer, don't, you can, 20, 25 minutes is also I, fine. It's I so want interesting. people to ask questions. Yeah, That's yeah, the point. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, and, I mean, I, I know what I know, and, and, and you know, you, you guys may have other interests, which is just the way it should be. <laughs> anyway, here, here's the end of, the, of that particular Torah. And you can see, anybody who knows what, it, this is how the last parasha, the last portion that we read um, uh, in the Torah is Ha'azino, and that's exactly the way it looks. Um, you can imagine that this Torah suffered terribly, and um, it was eventually, it was buried. Here you have more scrolls. Uh, that uh, that we managed to rescue. Again, some were beyond repair, some not. What are the scrolls? That you have like uh, the Book of Esther, uh, uh, various things that we Jews read from um, scrolls. Now, what we did when we could is we wrapped them all up as you uh, uh, put them in the trunks. And we went, again, still wet. Here you have some of those scrolls all, but still damp. It's essential that they still be damp because otherwise they're dead. It's over. Now, what do we put in these trunks? I'm going to show you some examples. Here's the oldest book that I knew about. When I say I, I you know, I, you, there was a huge amount of material. I couldn't go through it all. Um, and you do what you can to save what you can. But this is the oldest one that I found. And it, and it shows, okay, we're talking about Baghdad. And this was published in Venice, as you can say, in 1568. We were to find out, as you will see shortly, what we were to find out was that the uh, Iraqi, that Baghdad had 
connections with jewelry all over the world, the known world, because we found stuff from various places. We know this is from Venice. We know where Venice is. It's not close to Baghdad. Now, um, you know, for those who, who grew up in, in, in Baghdad, there was at one time Judeo-Arabic of Baghdad. It was his own language. And we in the West tend to think that people write a language in a script that, you know, English is written with Latin letters, Russian is written with Cyrillic letters, Arabic with Arabic letters, Hebrew with Hebrew. But that is a Western concept. In the Middle East, whatever your holy letters were is the language you wrote, your spoken language in those letters. That's why we have Judeo-Persian, which is Persian written, Jewish dialects written in Hebrew letters. Now, for those of you who see what we have in front of us, it was published, this one, in Livorno. Livorno is in Italy. If you look on the right-hand side at the bottom, it said Livorno was a place where many, until the, the 20th century, many, many of Iraqi uh, Jewish uh, books, materials, were printed there. Here, we had um Pilkel Vot, the ethics of our fathers with in the Arabi, with Arabic uh it's it, let's call it a translation. You can see the script of Hebrew, which was used right there, um, handwritten on again on the right hand side. I do not know how to read it, but there, thank God, are people who are very good at this. And it's done for the uh it, it, it's done according to it says that the custom of the community the holy community of Baghdad in the year it says Tarpah which is nineteen twenty eight which is ninety two years ago. Now um let's look at the left hand side and see what we say. The top is Hebrew. All the Jews have a portion of the world to come, and goes on and on and on. Now, let's look at the second paragraph right afterward. What, now, that is Arabic. That is the Judeo-Arabic used in Baghdad. And so you could call it, it's an interlinear translation of sorts, meaning why I say of sorts, it's like one line, two lines, whatever together. But, and so here you have one of the things that was published in Livorno, they do not, they speak Italian in Livorno. But, uh, 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 and I am not uh, an expert in Judeo-Arabic of Baghdad, but uh, uh, people who see this are just really, really wowed by this, really taken by it. Go on. Here is a Haggadah, a Pesa Haggadah that we found. Um, uh, and it, it looks like it first of Ezra Dangor. Dangor is at the very bottom of there. Um, who's, the Dangor family traces its origins to the Exilarchy. That is pre Islamic, the, the, the Jewish rulers of Iraqi Jewry. And that, so the people whose family name is Dangur believe that they are descended. Maybe they are. DNA today can do wonderful, unbelievable things. And if we could get some Dangurs to test, we would find some fascinating things. Let's go on. Here, 1971. Um, it is a Hebrew calendar, whatever like this. And again, it was published in Baghdad. And let's look, uh, here is a front page of a Jewish religious yearbook. And the leader of, um, uh, uh, of uh, the dictator of Iraq at the time was this Ahmed Hassan al-Bakr. And if I recall correctly, I think he's related uh, to Saddam. Um, I may be wrong, but I think so. Anyway, you see that we Jews have always, when we don't live in our ancient homeland, we always have to be a bit uh, unsure of uh, or worried about 
what may happen to us. And there was, for example, an article in the Jerusalem Post yesterday or the day before in which uh, there's a survey done in Britain and one out of five uh, Brits believes there is some validity to the theory that the Jews uh, created the coronavirus to, um, to make money by doing X, Y, and Z. I am no, I think it's absurd, but these are the things we had to worry about. Here you see the same picture as what are the Goyim saying about us, and we get afraid. So that's why you have the picture of the dictator. I can guarantee you that Jews had no love for this guy. Now, as I'm going through things, um, uh, I look at this, and I'm shocked. This is published in, we think in, in Vienna, we know in Vienna, but in, in 1848. And it is uh, the man who did this, uh, his name was Landau, who wrote this, and he lived in Prague. And why this is of particular importance to me personally is that his wife back in the 1700s, the wife of this man, was a distant cousin of mine. Uh, again, uh, when you don't know much about who you are from home. I've done a lot of work on genealogy, and someone mentioned um, uh, DNA, in, uh, in order to help reconnect uh, myself with, with our people. And so finding something like this was a marvelous thing for me, personally, but to see my hands on this. Here's another thing uh, published in Livorno, um, Evan Shlomo, M. Hamelach, Keren Yeshua. Again, you, the dates are all there. You can see on the slide. Here's another example of uh, one of the things that uh, about works which were done there. This is it says Kissa uh, Yosef Sadiq. Um, it's a, a story, if you wish, about Yosef Joseph the Tzaddik. The, the righteous person, and it's about our, um, uh, our um, uh, you know, uh, Joseph of biblical time. Now, let's just look at the beginning of, of how this thing, let us read, it's in Hebrew script, Bismillah rahman rahim Does anybody, oh, I can, can't hear anybody, so. Um, uh, that is how Muslims start their prayers, but that, is um, at, the, at the beginning of this. And this is Hebrew letters galore. But anybody who knows Hebrew and doesn't know Arabic won't understand, although understand some things, but mostly not. Here is an amulet, a kamea, a, 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 a uh, Kabbalistic prayer that we found in, in this is actually in somebody's house uh, with Jews that I met there who, uh, are now in Israel. Uh, again, it's 2003, and today is 2017 years ago that this story basically took place. Now, what else did we find there? We found communal records below. Here, what we have um, are lists of, this is from the Frank Ianni School. Anybody who knows Carol Bustry, it's her grandfather, um, who founded the school because uh, there were problems for Jews getting an education. And he, you know, it was a, a remarkable family. And I want to tell a little side story at the moment. As I told you, this place, this whole story is filled with miracles. Um, uh, Edwin Shooker, if you're on the line, I'm saying hi, but I know you can't respond. Um, Edwin Shooker, when eventually this uh, material was uh, like 1% was put on display, not even that, at the um, uh, National Archives in Washington. Edward was forced to flee Baghdad, um, if I'm correct, around 1972. He and his family, they awoke one day and they went up north. The Kurds got them out and all that. So Edward was not able to take with him anything from his family, from his uh, family material, because if they had anything like documents, like passports, like like the school materials, whatever, um, then uh, they would say that they were not on a summer vacation in the north, and they would have been in serious trouble. When Edward goes to see 
the exhibition in Washington, there were only 27 artifacts representing one for each of the 2,700 uh, 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 articles that we found. And the number is, um, is deceiving because that's what you see in front of you. This is a book, it's one article with tons and tons of, of report cards and things like this. Edward tells me, because I, I saw him two hours later, and I wasn't there with him, unfortunately. The miracle. He sees his report card, his picture, his report card. And he said, I cried like a baby. It's like, oh my God, everything that, you know, I, I left with nothing. Every, here, here's part of me. It's mine. And there, there are stories like this. This entire project is filled with these, if you wish, coincidences or otherwise. What is one of the other things we found here? We had long lists of Baghdadi Jews. It's 1949. Um, I have the wrong year here. The males, heads of family, by quarter. Uh, it's just so-and-so with a, a first name, a personal name, and then his father's name. There are no family names. But we, we have tons of this stuff. Now, after the Jews leave, uh, or here it's towards the end, where it's extremely difficult. You see, this is 49 to 53. The, it's 50-51 where, where most Jews leave and the overwhelming um, majority live, uh, uh, descendants and all live in Israel. Uh, but this is, you can see it says Jewish communal fin financial records from those years. Here, this building is the Frank Aini School, built by uh, Carol Busby's uh, grandfather, where the Jews studied the school, from what I understand, was still in use, but of course there were no Jews to attend it. Here are more records. If you are interested in, in, in uh, Baghdadi, uh, the, the history of the Jews of Baghdad and all that, there's a lot of family material in this collection. And then I went to visit uh, the neighborhoods which were Jewish. I thank God had a marvelous guide. Um, I am here to talk about it. I didn't realize, I, I, shall I say, I chose not to realize how, how dangerous it was. If you look on the, the lentil, that is the big uh, stone thing across in the middle, how you, among other things, know that it's part of Shorja, the Jewish house entry, is there's a, a, a circle and on top is a hey, this is for Hashem, for God, that they should be protected. Here, is, um, uh, and this still existed in 2003. I have no idea what, what the story, it's a religious building of ours. And there's Aramaic across the top. Unfortunately, I, these pictures were only in eight um, uh, kilobytes at the time because I didn't, you know, the technology was nowhere near as good as today. And anybody who is prepared or wants to work on my slides and to improve them, I'm very happy. To, I'll be happy to give it to anybody. As far as I'm concerned, this is not my material. This belongs to the Jewish people, specifically to the Jews of Baghdad. It is our patrimony, and we it belongs to everybody. Um, here is a Jewish house. And uh, 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 you can see what it is. Every, there was a courtyard. Those of you who grew up in Baghdad would know what I'm talking about. And it was so hot in the summers that people would sleep on the roof uh, because at least they could get breezes uh, at night. Uh, most of us who did not grow up there cannot realize how hot things are. <clears throat> now, just to give you a few other things. Here, this is not a Jewish scene. There's something called the killing fields. And these are places after the 1991 war where America liberated Kuwait that the uh, uh, Americans, uh, unknowingly, they certainly didn't do it on purpose, allowed Saddam to use afterwards military helicopters. And what they, they did was, because the, uh, the Kurds and the Shiites basically revolted, and what they did was send, um, and they were, they arrested, arrested is a nice word, they captured all sorts of especially young men. They put them on buses and took them into this area where they, they, dug, they dug 
a big pit and just killed everybody. And unlike the efficiency of the Nazis, they did not take off people's the clothes and they did not, um, uh, uh, people had identity cards. And here you find, this is in 2003, I'm at one of these killing fields all alone, um, watching people looking for the bodies of their loved ones. And um, to show you how Iraq is a place where one day they love you and the next day they hate you or in reverse, um, I am talking on a satellite phone to one of Secretary, or Vice President Cheney's uh, uh, assistants, and I am translating as best as I can what these people are saying. No, this is not, it's, it, you know, the identity card isn't clear. He wasn't wearing these clothes on that day and all that and all. But these were people looking for, you know, their family members. I'm talking, I'm not even looking about what's happened. All of a sudden, there is more than like a semicircle around me, screaming at me. Why did you let this happen? And I say to my friend, uh, at the White House, I said, John, I'm in a, a situation I got to get myself out of. I don't know how I managed to, to say the right things, but I said to the people, I said, we didn't, I said, I know we think differently and you think differently. We know that when we don't understand each other, I said, we didn't know this was happening. And when we found out, we were ashamed, we were humiliated. No one ever wants to be humiliated in the Middle East. And their hatred in their eyes turned to sweet love. And they said to me, it's because of you that we're liberated. We're now free for the first time in 1400 years. They're Shiites and they've been oppressed. Their whole history is being oppressed by the Sunnis. And you let it happen. Well, let's not, where Iraq is today is sad. And, you know, many people made mistakes. Let's just go on to a few more things. Here we are. In Babylon, this is the city of Babylon, and you know Psalm 137, over by the waters of, 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 uh, of Babylon, there, uh, uh, there we cried, there we, um, whatever, when we thought about Zion. And I remember calling a rabbi of mine um, uh, in, in, in this area where I live, I tell him where I am, and just it was absolutely an awesome, an awesome, awesome thing. Now Saddam built all sorts of, um, uh, you know, he was the greatest man in history, right? And so he tried to compare himself to Nebuchadnezzar. And if you remember Nebuchadnezzar, it was his people that came and took us from Jerusalem to um, to Babylonia. Now. Uh, we're, we're going to end with just a few more slides, and that is it. Here, this is me, and I'm being held by this friend of mine. Again, that's the Max Singer, the guy that I just mentioned before. I am al Neharot Bavel. I am over the waters of Babylon. In Hebrew, you're not by the waters of Babylon. You're over the waters of Babylon. So that's me. Um, uh, there and uh, I cannot tell you this was one of the greatest experiences in my life. Now the question was, why did Saddam have all this material and where did he get it from? What we knew is this was the last functioning synagogue in Baghdad. What was functioning? Every old men got together every once in a while. There were actually videos which were smuggled out. And here is the synagogue, the last one that was functioning. And as everything else closed, the upper levels here in this synagogue are where the records, where, where the Jewish communal property and, and prayer books and religious art, artifacts were all kept until, well, we'll get back to what happened in a moment because life is amazing, again, with coincidences. Here, you have the 37-year-old Shochet, maybe one of the 20 Jews of Baghdad at the time. And this is me at the synagogue. I'm, I'm, I'm the guy without the beard. And um, I, daven, I I prayed uh, the afternoon prayer of Mincha there. It was a very, very emotional experience. By the way, just as an aside, this guy, not me, um, uh, uh, Ahmad is his name. 
uh, 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 shortly thereafter, he and his father and a bunch of other Jews were airlifted they, to Jordan, and then they managed to whatever make it to Israel. He married a woman in Israel. There's nobody to marry if you're Jewish uh, in Baghdad. And he married this woman whose parents were from Baghdad, and they, he's now he's about 50 or so, and he's got kids, and his Hebrew is beautiful, and uh, it was just awesome. He's an old guy who is, uh, and I'm sure not alive anymore. This, he was at the time somewhere between 87 and 92 in 2003. So let's say it's almost sure, uh, sure that he did not, um, that he is not alive today. But I want to go back. He was living at this compound where the synagogue is. Where is it? Here we are. Now, what happened? One day, uh, I'm giving a lecture. It's December of 2003 here in Washington on this. And a woman stands up and when it's question time, and she said to me, Harold, do you remember me? And she, uh, I, I, from the face, I did not. And she told me her name. I said, oh my God, you're one of the people, Saddam hung your father. And I met you at a conference on Jewish students. You had just managed to make it to Holland. And um, uh, anyway, yeah, it, 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 you never know why these things happen, you know. But she said, Harold, I know how the material got to the Iraqi uh, the the intelligence services. The night that one night I was at the shul, I was at the synagogue, and two huge trucks pulled up and they said, we are taking everything you have. Um, uh, we're taking your, your archives. And they came and they took it. And she said, and I witnessed it. So now we know, and that was in 1984, that it was stolen. Okay, we have these pictures. Now, where are we here? Kifun. Again, maybe it's about 100 kilometers, 60 miles or so, I think, south of Baghdad. This is the tomb of uh, Ezekiel, Yechezkel. Um, the Jews would go there on Shavuot, so they would be, if we were, were still whatever in Baghdad, they would have, be going down and they would stay there for Shavuot, so they would go there, other prophets, whatever, in the north, they would go to. That's simply a Marine friend of mine, uh, awesome human beings, the Marines. Um, if you look up on top of this picture, this is at Kifun, um, uh, you can see Hebrew inscriptions. I don't know what the story is today. Um, they have done their damnedest to make life difficult, um, very sadly. Um, and they always turn, this is Muslims turn whatever they get into mosques, Muslim, uh, whatever. So um, that's why they knew that when, when the Jews took the Temple Mount in the 67 war, that, we, that they were finished. But unfortunately, whatever, it didn't turn out that way. And that, in essence, we go back to the first slide. This, in essence, is the story of the archives. Maybe I could add just uh, one more thing. How did it, what happened to it? And where is it now? And what is possibly what is going to happen? Well, the Iraqis, of course, say it is Iraqi property. Well, all of it was stolen from Jews. So why does it belong to Iraq? And there is a crazy, there's a, a good-hearted international law um, which says that if you take over a country, you cannot take its historical heritage and all. Oh, that makes sense, because people in the past would steal things, uh, history. But in this case, this belonged to the Jews of Baghdad. It belonged to them personally. Um, they donated the material to the synagogue for themselves. It did not belong to the state of Baghdad, or state of Iraq. And today, between 85 and 90 percent of the descendants of Iraqi Jewry live in Israel. And there is an Iraqi Jewish museum there in Ol Yehuda, outside of Tel Aviv, near the airport. And that's, to me, where the appropriate place that it it belongs. But you know, government officials, being what they are, they have done their damnedest that that not happened. Suppose that they were going to try to sneak it back from the United States. Well, how did it get to the United States? 
we made an agreement, the United States, with the American bureaucrat who was representing the uh, Ministry of Culture in Iraq, that we would take this out and we would restore it and then send it back to Baghdad. In essence, it's an agreement between America with an American State Department diplomat. Um, the reason why done that way is because we once we took over Iraq, we had sovereignty. Iraq did not. And so the Americans had you know, temporary health ministers, temporary system, whatever. Anyway, it is uh, flown to on a small plane to um, to Texas, where the restoration began, and they did a beautiful. They, they freeze dried it. Once you freeze dry it, it stops all the rotting of the material. So there is hope. Anyway, I mentioned this wonderful archivist who wasn't. Trying, you know, who was told not to help me, but she did help me. What happened, well, she was on the plane. And listen to this next, if you wish, miracle. She is on the plane. It's the middle of the summer. All this material, once the Americans got it, was on refrigerated trucks. I said Americans can do anything. It's on a plane, which is basically refrigerated. It's cooled, so it, again, we could prevent deterioration. What happens? It has to land, it's a small plane, and it lands um, in Crete. And there's a naval base, if I'm correct, and a NATO base. And um, in order to refuel the plane, they need to turn off the engines. If you turn off that, which means the electricity goes, if the electricity goes, then all the material starts to rot again. So the archivist is on the plane, this is, she's not Jewish, um, she radios the head of the base, who was an American, for electricity. And he says, it's not possible, and this, that, and thing. And the conversation becomes, the voices get raised. raised. And the guy who's the head, the military, the, the naval officer, or whatever, he says, I got to come out and see what's going on. He comes out and sees what's going on. And she, know, she knew the moment she saw him, from the distance, there would be no problem getting the electricity. Because believe it or not, guys, he had a keep on. He was Jewish. Why he had a keep I can't answer. But the stories like this permeate the entire project. If one thing had gone wrong, we wouldn't have it today. The material, and with this I'll end, is in the National uh, Archives, out not far actually from where I live. I would say maybe about if most. Um, uh, 20 miles, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, 30, uh, what is it, 36 kilometers. And um, uh, it's in limbo. It still is here. There is no, the Iraqi government can't guarantee security or safety for anything. And it really doesn't exist. Um, Iraq basically, is, it, it doesn't really exist today. It's portions and, and fiefdoms and whatever. And so it's here. And God willing, it will remain here for a while. Every time we have come close to it being to have to be returned, um, uh, uh, miraculously, it got saved. And uh, frankly, uh, the, the Trump people have been extremely helpful on this. And we'll leave it at there. We don't need people, please, to go and, and, and beg for uh, to say anything right now. Uh, it's better that it stay in limbo. And with that, I will open it up to questions, and Lynn, you will do and say whatever you wish to do. You're running the thing now, and um, uh, you know, I, I hope that uh, that uh, that it was interesting for people. Yeah, fa fantastic, fascinating stuff, Harold. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, but of course, we need the final miracle, which is for it to stay outside Iraq. And the question is, uh, what can we do? Um, us personally um, to you know to make sure it does not go back there so um, I think perhaps I will just ask uh, David Bassoon to say a few words if you're there David I am here can you hear me yes okay I mean as thank you Harold for this uh, very interesting uh, lecture and uh, background to the archives thank you uh, 
I am very much involved in uh, in the whole area of the cultural uh, heritage of Iraqi Jews, and uh, one of the issues that uh, um, what I understand is that we have been trying to avoid uh, a real confrontation with the Iraqi government and the State Department. But at the end of the day, we have to prepare ourselves to this ev eventuality, and we have to prepare uh, a full uh, teams of lawyers who will uh, uh, raise a, a class uh, action on behalf of all the Iraqi Jews who many of them have uh, actually private documents and property that were stolen from homes, uh, as well as the public uh, domain, like uh, what I would call it the institutional synagogue and the school and so on. So uh, I would not want my record filed. I'm a living person and many of my, our friends who are from the school uh, and I'm talking about much more on the private side, the emotional side, as opposed to the religious and the Torah scrolls and all this, which is very, very important. But there is a very important issue uh, here where the property is really private and we are still living. It's not an archaeological that belongs to, the, to, the, to Iraq. Uh, I have said in the past, uh, neither Muhammad or Abbas is interested in my school records or my uh, uh, vaccination or uh, whatever uh, documents there, but I would love to show it to my children and my grandchildren and so on. So there is a very, very strong element here that we should always try to, uh, to raise it uh, if it comes to it and not to find that we suddenly uh, are, is, are surprised by the fact that they are returning it. Because once it's returned to Iraq- It's over. Okay. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I would only argue that for the year, for many, many years, uh, um, uh, Carol Bustry has been working on this and uh, I, she, I think she's in Israel under, again, in the lockdown right now. And she, she told me uh, that she, uh, th there was a reason not to do it now because some of the, I, again, I'm not a lawyer. It's beyond me. I don't really know um, uh, what to say, but I can only say. Uh, uh, yeah, if, if, I, if I can just say what, what I think happened was, uh, um, she prepared a whole legal case uh, for for the archive to stay in the U.S. Uh, but then it, it turned out that the State Department ha actually hadn't decided to send it back to Iraq, so there was no point in in suing the the American government for this. I think that's the way I understood it. Yes, because it's been postponed almost every two years and for another two years. But at some stage, and, and, and thank right. God, there are, all, there are always the troubles in Iraq and always a new government and everybody forget about the previous uh, things. And all, so to our benefit, this is happening. But right. we can always have unpleasant surprise. And that, yes. that, that is the problem. Please, uh, um, I, I, can, I, can I just make one point? There is on the net, the, the uh, National Archives, has, uh, what's the word, they've scanned at a very, very high level, uh, uh, the archives. And you can, if you go, I think it's called I, IJA, Iraqi Jewish Archives, uh, a, a NARA, National, uh, uh, N for Nancy, A, R for Rachel, A, uh, which is part of, it's the National Archives of Archive the United of States. It's, it's so beautiful. We've done a beautiful job, but it's not the same. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, yes. Okay. Okay. It's not the same as you having your documents. I totally agree with you. But, but you see, even, for example, when they uh, invited the Iraqi ambassador to the burial of a fragment of the Torah, that, in my opinion, I told Maurice Shuhat at the time, that was a mistake because it, it gives kind of a credence to the concept that Iraq has right 
to such a thing and should, they should be present. Right, I think we have Maurice Shohet on the call. Perhaps he'd like to have a word, if you can find him. Yeah, I'll find him. Right. So just to give you some background, what happened was a fragment of a Torah scroll was actually given a burial in the, I think, Babylon, I think it was called the Cemetery of Babylon outside New York a few years ago and there was a whole ceremony and the Iraqi ambassador to the US was invited there. So perhaps uh, Maurice Shohet would like to comment no, or uh, we'll just, uh, while we're waiting for Maurice Shohet, I just Maurice want Shohet's to, been unmuted. Oh, okay. yeah, uh, okay, Maurice, <coughs> thanks, go ahead. Uh, uh, Julius. Uh, David Bassoon, just to answer your comment, the ambassador was invited by the State Department. And we cannot say to the State Department whom to invite and whom don't invite. So we are lucky that we got all the, the agreements of all the sides. I mean, the US government and the Iraqi government to give us these parchments for burial, and we insisted that have to be buried. What happened, it was in 2013, the Iraqi ambassador said he will definitely uh, take part and participate in the burial. So it came yeah. from the State Department. Thanks, Maurice. Sure. Right. Actually, there's this whole question of whether Israel should be involved in trying to recover the archive. I mean, what is your feeling about that? Because Israel has actually hitherto had quite a low profile, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, it certainly has a, a, a above scene, above okay. board. You're right, above board. Yes, but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. And do you think, the, yeah. the people are very care, care about it in Israel. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that we can, you know, uh, argue about all sorts of small details of the thing. What, what, what is important is that it, it not go back to Iraq. And um, uh, again, for those of you who want to look for specific things, please uh, uh, go um, on the uh, uh, on the net. And I, again, I, I have not spent the time maybe that I should have. Uh, but you'll see what there's so many more things than, than I knew about because um, uh, uh, let's say that after uh, the American government took it over, they wanted to own it and they don't necessarily, this is bureaucracy. And they don't like, uh, shall we say, other people, especially people of my, uh, um, you know, I open my mouth and I, 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 let's say I can make trouble. They don't like mm -hmm. that. <laughs> Uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, at my grand old age of 70, I'm not about to stop. <laughs> well, no, keep opening your mouth. I think it's a good thing. Uh, just to say that Carmen Hacham, who's on the call, says that her school report is in the archive. Um, I should a question. Seen it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> been have, into call, yeah. Uh, have you have you actually seen your school report, Carmen? Yes, I have. And do you have Hi. a copy what were your of it? Feelings when you saw it. Um, it was very emotional. It was it was there with my full name as I was known at the time. It was very emotional, but it's it's mine. It belongs to me. It does not belong to Iraq. As David said, I'm a living human being. It should. I I don't particularly. I'm not bothered if I never had it, but it belongs to me. I don't want it to go back to Iraq. I feel very strongly about it, extremely strongly about it. So, yeah. And would you say join a, join a class action if there was one? It's very get... interesting because yeah. I was talking to my other half, who's a judge in this country, and he's, his opinion, and he obviously has absolutely no idea how the American system works, is that this is exactly what has to happen. It's got to be a class action brought by the individuals who claim... Um, who have claims on the various um, archives, including the communal archive, such as the Sifre Torah. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So yes, it, I think I think what David said is correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question here from David Gartan. Has anyone from the Iraqi Jewish community who reads and understands Arabic actually been through all the documents? So that's what hundreds, uh, thousands of documents. Do you know the answer to that? Let me just say it's impossible for anybody to go through it all. It's not possible. Well, right. It's just huge. It's absolutely huge. It's awesome. And I want to tell you, when I was involved in, in you know, in and the whole process of, of rescuing it in the beginning, I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew I had to. And we didn't have time to look. The more that you look, let me give you examples. There is a guy, Yaakov Zamir, a scholar who uh, really works at the archives at the Jewish Museum in Ol Yehuda. Um, this guy has found unbelievable things. I think they produced two or three, four books already, and there are going to be more on the Jews of Iraq in the Talmud. In some of the uh, books uh, that they found, they found notes uh, from, with signatures of rabbis that they knew the names of, but they didn't know anything about historically. And all of a sudden, their thoughts, their ideas, come to, they come alive in this archive. It's unbelievable. I'm going to share something they prepared earlier. <laughs> no, don't, 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 can I just have it? Well, that's about it. Your affidavit says that on the screen. Okay, so um, I don't know if anyone can see this, but I was asked by Carol Basri to prepare an affidavit which would be used in an eventual court case against, uh, against the U.S. National Archives, actually. And that was because my own family has a connection with the archive. I've read books. His name was uh, Shlomo Hussein Deho, and in, at the end of the 19th century. So I was asked to show that I had a connection, an emotional connection, and all the rest of it. <laughs> but of course, this court case hasn't uh, actually gone through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If everyone can see this. Anyway, so are there any other questions? Would anyone like to ask? Uh, Vivian? Vivian asked, uh, what, what, um, what has happened to the archive today? I think we've answered that one. It's in America. It's not very far from where Harold lives in Washington. What about 20 miles from there? Um, where is it in a warehouse or something? Oh no, it's part of the Harold? archives. It, it, it's held in the archives. Um, uh, uh, okay. it's, it's held in the archives. It's actually in it, the archives. It's right next to the University of Maryland. Um, for and if anybody w wants, just write me and I'll refer. My email is simply my family name dot my first name at gmail dot com. So um, uh, uh, I'm happy. You know, uh, well, I'm happy. To this is something. This is this is. You know, I, I when I. I, I, when, when all of a sudden this happened, I'm the only one around who, who knew Hebrew, Arabic, and you know, some Aramaic, who could read a lot of this stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I firmly believe that, again, they're not coincidences. And uh, if I don't know, if, if I hadn't been there, there would have just, you know, I don't know this, but I just assume nothing would have happened. But there is a funny story in, in, in all of this. I mentioned Monday that we found this on a Monday. The Israel section, which I had gone into, um, and all sorts of amazing things. They had maps of Demona, they had map, uh, they had the uh, pictures of Saddam with, uh, with, uh, um, uh, uh, with uh, the, the Dome of the Rock, with a rifle, form, they, whatever. And uh, they had a book, I was very, very close with Uri Lubani, who was one of Israel's the second generation founding fathers, an awesome human being. And he and Bernard Lewis, the, the, tomorrow is his uh, second uh, anniversary of his death. 
um, uh, they uh, were interviewed for something called Hamtsula uh, Shayirani, the Iranian Crying War. And that, that book was there. And there was all sorts of things. There was a sign which said, who was going to shoot off the 40th rocket? Um, um, and what it meant is Israel, during the, uh, uh, the 1999 war, Iraq had uh, shot uh, 39 missiles at Israel. And who, the question is, who's going to shoot the 40th is what, what was listed there. But I must say there was a very strange thing that happened. One day I arrived at there. And someone had systematically, someone, some, I don't know who, systematically taken apart the Israel section. Um, piece by piece by piece. The whole thing was gone. I don't know how. I don't know who would be interested in it except one particular uh, little place. But I could, I have no idea. All I know is I, I noted it. That's all we could do is note it. Anyway, um, there was... Um, there were amazing people from all over the world uh, there. And um, there was somebody, it was very clear with perfect American English, except one letter was not perfect. And that was the M, the Mem letter. And then ended, I, it was clear to me, it was Israeli. And I pulled them aside and we had, I said, you know, in Hebrew, I said, what are you? I said, the, I said, isn't this wonderful? All the things that we're finding here and all that. And the guy turned green. But it was fun. It was fun. Fun for the soul. I don't mean, uh, uh, we, we learned and saw awesome things. And I can only hope that, um, uh, that what, we, uh, what we did here will help contribute to understanding the glorious in, uh, uh, history of, of the Jews of Baghdad. Um, and I see that Tzionit uh, Cooper uh, Vassar is on this video and she has written a marvelous marvelous book um on uh, uh on, on basically uh, jewish life in in baghdad and for anybody it's still neat if you're i can see your face uh um is has it been translated into english you want to add me see you need see you need i'm on Just... you now see you need okay see you need coming on now no, I don't know. Not yet. She, yeah, listen. No. Yeah. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> oh, but I'll do it. Are. But I'll do it. I'll do it. I <laughs> promise. <laughs> because it, Not it, yet is it, the answer. Not yet in English. It, okay. <laughs> okay. I, I think on this note. Look, I have a, I, 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 it's, yeah, yeah. I think it would be wonderful for all sorts of non-Hebrew speakers and non-Arabic speakers because it was translated into Arabic as well. Um, that, that uh, and I, the I world, think the know. remarkable thing is Sionit is someone who, if I'm right, uh, was not born in Iraq, but is, is maintaining the memory of the Iraqi Jewish community. And she's building bridges uh, with Iraqi Muslims and she's doing fantastic work. Everyone has now been unmuted, and if you want to say something, just unmute yourself yeah. on your computer and you yeah. can... If there's anyone, anyone who wants to make, to make one or... last point, no? Okay, I think I will just wrap up now and say thank you so much, Good Harold, job. for an absolutely thank fascinating you. talk. And I know Good people job, have commented Harold. on the chat to say how much they've enjoyed it and how much they've learned from what you had to say. And thank and you, thank you so much. It's, it's a labor of love. <laughs> no, I think it's wonderful, and I think we should believe in miracles. And the greatest miracle is that you were there in Baghdad to discover this amazing treasure. Um, Thank the so, guy upstairs, not me. <laughs> I to say one last thing. We've got four more lectures planned, and if you look at our kind of cinema billboard, you can see the next four lectures. I think the first of June, the second of June, the ninth, and the eleventh. And we'd love to see you again. So, what what I want to draw your attention to is next week. There are two events about the Farhood. One is being organized by Jemena, that's on uh, Monday, the 1st of June, and it will feature uh, a gentleman who actually lived through the Farhood, Joe Samuels, and he'll be in, in uh, a discussion with Lily Shaw, who we know from the Babylonian Jewry Heritage Center in Or Yehuda. And on the 2nd of June, 
uh, I will giving, be giving a talk on the role of the British in Iraq. Were they good for the Jews? So please do come and join us for those two talks. And there are other talks planned as well. Please do subscribe to our, uh, our website at www.harif.org to be kept up to date with our events. Up until then, stay safe, stay well, and Thank all you. the best. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.